So welcome everyone to this uh, workshop on computational reproducibility, or that we're going to focus a lot about, you know, why the code doesn't reproduce. Uh, it's, it's based on what we've been working on at the journal I'm editing and we're Lucia, who is uh, going to do most of this talk actually, is the um, computational reproducibility checker and journal assistant that. So yeah. Uh, next slide. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about today about our computation reproducibility assessment or what we like to call like reaper checks at Metastar Call You. We're going to talk about common errors in computation reproducibility. Uh, and that's going to be based a lot about the errors we see when we are looking at this for the submission we have. Uh, and we're going to look at some of the best practices that we have discovered for how to uh, make the analysis reproducible. Uh, then we're going to have an exercise, which will be ab about an hour. Um, you will have some time to have some little coffee break or something during that time as well. So where our intention is for your, you to work in like in, in pairs, how we can team up um, with uh, actually working hands-on with seeing if we can get things to reproduce. And then we're going to have like a joint discussion about the, the challenges uh, and what we learned from this, this part. So that's just the full two hours. Uh, and before we start with the presentation, I think it's good to have like a quick overview of the exercise. So this is what you will have in mind. So think of this like a test, you know? <laughs> oh, after the presentation, we will want you to work with and look if you can actually look at reproducibility for uh, some submissions, some articles. Um, so keep this in mind that we want you to try and reproduce code from a paper that is accepted publication in Metsocology. And we want you to note down what's causing troubles in reproducing the paper. And also note down what you find that is actually correctly done, that's working well. And then finally, if you have time to so compare the results from the code output to the report the results in the manuscript. Um, yeah. Okay. So next question is um, then why would you, why do we even care about this? Why is this important? Well, uh, as Nozick talked about during his uh, keynote speech, transparency is a way out of the replication crisis. But transparency only allows us assessing reliability of research findings. It doesn't automatically mean that everything will just start working. So we're doing a lot of work towards transparency, open science, but that can, in the worst case, that can mean that we're showing everyone how unreliable our science is. That can, as you talked about, reduce trust in science so, or make it in the middle ground. So it's also very important that we're using this new transparency and openness to, um, take the time and actually assess our research findings in more detail now that we actually can. And so far, much of the focus have been given to um, replication. Uh, and replication is when you are doing the same type of analysis, but you're doing it on, uh, on a new data set. So you, you repeat the study, collect new data, run all through it, and then you see if you get the same result. Um, and as you understand, there are many reasons why it, that replication might fail. It could be a false positive, or it could be a problem with analysis in the, in the previous part, and, and so on. There are many steps towards that. But of course, that's a very interesting end point. So it made sense to have a lot of focus on that. And that's why we often call it the replication crisis rather than a reproducibility crisis. Um, also, quite a lot of focus have been on robustness. That is that if you do new analysis on the same data, you should get very similar results. This is where the whole garden of the forking paths, uh, p hacking, everything that comes in, in like saying that, well, look, these people that had done this specific analysis of this paper, when we do something slightly different, the results are no longer significant, or I apply Bayesian methods to it and I come to another conclusion. And there are some cool projects there, like for example, the Men Analyst Project and similar, where we're really going into detail, looking at uh, how much do results vary. Um, 
how robust are our results? And we have among the more extreme examples are the multiverse analysis, where you're essentially trying to create a, how do you do all types of analysis on a paper. But then we have the same data, but we do new analysis on it. And we want things to be fairly similar, and then we believe that our findings are robust. But so far, I would say that uh, less attention has been given to the most basic part of it. That is, our data, our analysis, and reporting should be free from errors. And, and this can pretty much be summarized into computation reproducibility. Um, and computation reproducibility is, strictly speaking, that, that assuming that we have a data set that is correct, then someone should be able to apply the same analysis to it and come to the same conclusion and reach the same results as was before. Then we have computational reproducibility. Um, it is not strictly saying about checking that the data uh, is correct per se, but uh, data processing, cleaning, and so on is under computational reproducibility. But we're not looking at the veracity of the raw data or, or the primary data or the source data. So things like, um, like uh, well, research fraud, research misconduct, when people have created data uh, should not fall into this. However, things like that screening for outliers uh, or removal of outliers and so on, definitely falls under computational reproducibility because that is a practice that if transparently done and some, then someone can reproduce it, then we know that, well, you got this result here because you removed two outliers. Then, then that's not necessarily a problem, right? And, and if we look at things like, um, like um, questionable, research pra questionable research practices uh, that are about that you have just been data dredging and looked at and, and and like went star hunting to try and, try and find what's significant and so on. These practices aren't necessarily so problematic if they are, if we can fully reproduce all the steps. It is problematic then if, if someone has, you know, run like tons of analysis and then, then they found something that, that worked in the end. That's not necessarily a problem because if we know how to come to it, we can, we can actually assess it. So by that we can have full computation reproducibility is also a way to actually tackle things like um, uh, questionable research practices. So it, it, it really, we, we, we gain quite a bit from it just by checking that we can follow on all the steps going through a data set, from a data set to what is reported. But despite that this is something that is fairly similar versus that we go out and do all new uh, new studies, which is, I mean, contacting new replications all the time, that is perhaps feasible in, say, social psychology or uh, decision-making research, when you have like simple vignette studies, when you have a Linda is a bank teller uh, research, or when you have a trolley dilemma or, or sim, sim like that, then it's, it's no big deal. We can just repeat the experiments if we get the same results. But if you have done uh, um, a, a classroom intervention, for example, across uh, across 30 schools. These are very expensive projects, or you might have been studying um, students who have uh, learning disabilities and so on, which are populations that are hard to study and, and this data is precious. Then it's super important that all analysis on it actually turns out to be correct. So as we move into areas in, in the replication crisis, where data and our experiments and so on are, are very precious, which I would say is, is the case in education, much more than, let's say, in social psychology, where a lot of replication and so on started, then maybe we can't rely as much on uh, uh, replication, but we have to really be, make sure that what we actually reported works. So this is where computational reproducibility checks come in. But at this point, they are still very, very rare. So the slide, yeah. And this is uh, where we think that we are being pioneering in this, in the journal of metapsychology. So metapsychology uh, is rated number one on top factor. I'm not sure if everyone knows about top factor, but it's kind of like an alternative to impact factor, whereas instead of citations, we look at how transparent and open uh, journal practices are. So we look at things like data sharing, pre-registration, 
uh, reporting guidelines and like and everything like that. Uh, and there are several hundreds of journals ranked there. There and you know. Uh, uh, most of social science journals, but also journals like science and nature and so on is on that. So every journal gets audited by a team connected to the Center of Open Science. They go through all the journals and see what kind of open science practices are enforcing. And, and, and we are um, currently ranked number one on that, uh, but there are some other good journals um, that are also very, very, very close. Um, that are relevant, that can be relevant in for educational research or education psychology anyway. Um, and, and one thing they have started to actually look at recently is looking at whether computational reproducibility checks are actually being done. So, and Metapsychology is a community run journal. So this means that this we are not owned by a, a, um, a big organization uh, or like a, like a society. We are also not owned by one of the uh, bigger publishing houses. We're not connected to Elsevier or Taylor Francis or Springer Nature or anything like that. Um, instead, we are self-owned by our editorial board. And it's a journal that is connected to the community and people who are invested in trying to make uh, research more transparent and increase research quality in this area. We don't have any article pro uh, processes charges and it's open access. So it's free to publish with us and it's free to read. And in general, we publish anything meta in psychology. And by meta, we read something very wide. So uh, jokingly, uh, like uh, jokingly, we can say that we publish everything that most journals don't publish uh, as typical, you know, but this, the bread and butter that is a typical experiment or a typical study, typical empirical study in in the most common journals, that is what we don't publish. But we publish everything else like reviews, meta-analysis, commentaries, replications, uh, uh, meta-science perspectives, and, and, and so on. And actually one of the things we are going to start publishing uh, uh, very soon uh, is something called verification reports, where you can actually take a look at one study and it's published. It doesn't have to be published in our journal. It can be published in another journal. Uh, so let's say that you you find that, well, here is a, a, a very, very important study done on, for example, a classroom intervention, large-scale study done that is published in, let's say, an Elsevier journal, like a top journal field or whatever. Uh, and it's highly cited. It's very important, very important for the field to know that this data, that the data and report, and report results and analysis are correct. Then you can actually submit that as a verification report that we will very much likely keep in the register report format. So, and then basically you will audit that study to see is it computation is the computation reproducible. So this is actually a way to get get the published article out of doing um, whatever we're doing routinely. So uh, let's say if you would if that would have been the case, you would have been a very very highly published author by now. Uh, but of course. This is not something we are going to be prepared to do for other, other articles routinely, uh, because this is really a task that journalists should do themselves. But it is interesting to, for important studies to do these verifications uh, for other journals as well. Uh, and education psychology is an area that we, we think are important. I mean, I'm, I'm editor-in-chief at this journal, and one of my main areas right now is in education psychology. And I'm... Um, my, uh, my my co-workers are presenting on later today on um, visible learning. Uh, you know, John, John had this big project and looking into whether that is reproducible and whether that is correct and so on. Uh, so education psychology is, is something that we are really interested in, you know, getting more into and publishing more of this meta content in, uh, into. So this is a little bit about advertisement for journal as well. Uh, but in this, this talk, what we're going to focus now on is our five years experience with doing computation reproducibility checks at MetaPsychology. Uh, and let's say have, you have been working with us for uh, how, two years now, right? A year and a half, maybe. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and you have been uh, doing quite a lot of reproducibility checks during this time because 
you kind of came in when we had like a huge backlog and, and 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 so on. So you are the person who has done most of these reproducibility checks at the journal um, in this 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 time frame. <clears throat> yeah. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, what I do at the journal and mostly what the process is like and what my experience has been so far. I think I've reproduced maybe. 10, 10 ish papers so far, maybe even more. Um, just an overview of the articles that we have reproduced. So since the journal has started, there have been 47 articles that were reproduced. And by this, we mean we reproduced all papers that actually had something to reproduce. Uh, we also uh, publish commentaries or theoretical papers that don't have analysis in them, but every paper that has uh, something to reproduce, we have done reproducibility checks on them. Um, and last year, uh, we had 13 papers that had to be reproduced, and a bit of statistics on these are that papers that reproduced without any error, which means I was able to find all of the data and materials easily uh, and uh, just click and run, and it would reproduce without errors. It was one study that had this. Um, and there was another one that didn't have any errors, but it was a large simulation study. So we had to change the number of iterations. So this one still didn't have any, it reproduced, but we had to change it a bit to actually run it. Um, for errors in code, there were eight papers that had errors in code, uh, like missing library calls or some kind of problems with missing the markdowns. Uh, even, we even had uh, container emulating packages like RN that caused issues with uh, loading some of the packages. There was a lot of issues with deprecated functions. So there are always some kind of code issue when running, especially if there is uh, a lot of analyses uh, and a lot of uh, different uh, code scripts. And then we also had errors in reported results, which means that the output didn't uh, equal to what was reported in the paper and those were found in six papers and those are usually really small and don't change the outcome or the uh, interpretation of the paper it's like wrong sample size but maybe like a number up or down wrong mean again is usually not a large difference there's some plot output discrepancies and usually it's uh, when there are copy paste errors or when uh, a package updates and then changes the output. Um, but all of these are errors that happen. We don't have a problem with reproducing things because uh, things are missing. And we also do all of this in collaboration with the authors. So even when we have all the data and materials and we know what we need to do and authors are willing to cooperate, there are still issues and we still sometimes struggle reproducing uh, these papers, especially if the analyses were done couple of years back, then a lot of things uh, go wrong when trying to reproduce them a couple of years later. Um, since I believe 2021, there has been this reproducibility, uh, reproducibility checklist uh, included in the journal uh, process of doing reproducibility. Before it wasn't really standardized in how the reproducibility checks are done. It was usually some kind of document that the reproducibility checker would write out with all the errors that they found. Uh, and then we switched to a bit of more easier to follow and easier to do um, standardized checklist, which usually means who reproduced it, their contact info in case uh, anyone is interested. Uh, we also state the ID of the uh, submission. Then we check if we can actually load in the data that, the way that they have presented it. Uh, if they archive the data in a way that it's archive ready format, so it's not an SPSS file of data sets, it's an actual TSV file, for instance. And then we check if we can find the code to reproduce figures, tables, or index numbers. We check if there are any requirements uh, for reproducing the papers uh, that we didn't know of. Uh, for instance, if we had to have um, stronger computers to run the simulations uh, or how long it takes to actually run this. And then we state which software we use. We also state our computing environment uh, because this is one of the biggest issues when it comes to reproducing. Um, and then we also describe uh, if we were able to find that everything replicates 
And also then we comment on where we found the issues, whether the authors actually fixed it, how they fixed it, uh, and what else, any comments that we have uh, on it. And these checklists are always published alongside with the peer review report. So anyone, once the paper is published, you can go and see the checklist and see what the issues maybe were. And also there is a peer review report at the end stating if everything we produced in the paper and um, if there were any issues along the way and how the authors actually fixed it. So there is, it's necessary for authors to fix issues uh, for the paper to actually be published. Although sometimes these things maybe cannot be fixed. For instance, if it's, if it's simulations that will take a really long time to run, then we have to change the code. Those are minor issues, but usually they have to fix everything and the code has to run and reproduce. And our main concern is that at least once we can reproduce the code and the results before publishing the papers, we don't expect it to run and for others to actually be uh, able to reproduce them later because there's just so many things that go into it that it, it's sometimes really hard. So some of the common errors, um, which some of I have already mentioned, but the common errors that uh, we found were uh, that happen when people rename files and then don't change it in the code. Uh, and then it's just a bit of annoyance to see where the files are and then trying to fix it yourself or the others have to fix it. Um, it's also common that functions don't work for whatever reasons. It can be not calling in the libraries or the functions no longer exist or they didn't use them correctly uh, or save them correctly in the script and then they didn't work once we tried to reproduce them. Uh, it's very common that they hard code the file paths and then it's just easy to change, but it cannot be quick uh, and reproduced at once. Um, and also a big issue is older software versions, especially for R when it updates uh, that causes issues. So the common reasons why they don't work is the functions don't work are usually incorrect input arguments, uh, undefined out of scope variables that are in, Missing or outdated dependencies, this is the most common one. It's very common that they don't load the libraries or state what the libraries should be. Uh, and also deprecated functions uh, are a big issue uh, in R, also in proper uh, syntax or using wrong uh, functions when they try to um, change the code from a non-open uh, source. For instance, if it was done in SPSS and then they try to redo it in R so we can reproduce it because we, uh, ask for them to be in an open source format, then some of the functions maybe not work uh, not work properly. Then we have the hard coding file paths, which is usually the most common uh, reason. Uh, but this is something that's very easy to fix. It's just something that causes this issue that it doesn't reproduce immediately. And then we have the software versions. So it's either not stating which version of the software was used and this causes uh, troubles. So uh, it's common that they have a different version that someone else has. Uh, and it's very hard to uh, have people to use containers um, to reproduce things, especially if they're not uh, com uh, very confident in using uh, coding. Uh, and also, on the other hand, some packages may stop working or be ma maintained, especially if they're uh, rarely used uh, and not commonly maintained packages. Uh, and those are most common reasons for code not working. And then we have the reasons for results not reproducing in a way that the output just doesn't equate to the code output. And most common ones are copy-paste errors, wrong rounding, and simulation-based analyses. Um, so the first one is especially common when they do bootstrapping for confidence intervals. They often forget to succeed for this. Uh, and this is a very minor issue. It usually doesn't change uh, the conclusions, but it's something that doesn't reproduce uh, because they don't the seeds. And the same thing for simulating data sets, although this is a bit rarer that they don't set a seed when they simulate data sets. It's mostly for uh, confidence intervals. Um, a different thing is wrong rounding uh, and copy paste errors. Uh, this is the most common issue. Um, it's just 
it, it's very self-explanatory that uh, it's just easier to copy paste outputs and when these uh, outputs change we don't even know why sometimes the rounding is so off that it doesn't even seem like the mistake was in rounding it, it's like the number just completely changed and it could be that the code changed maybe but uh, copy paste errors are very common uh, and based on these uh, we have some best practices and i think these best practices examples would be more to make it easy to find out what the error is once it doesn't reproduce rather than having it reproduce. Because even with the best practices, there could be issues. There were really some nice scripts that had a really, really silly issue and that the, it didn't reproduce. So I guess these best practices are more about making the structure so easy to follow that you know where the error is once it appears. Uh, and the first one is importance of structure. Um, it is not very common to see really nicely structured uh, analyses uh, and projects in general. And one resource that could be useful to uh, psychologists is the psych data sets. It is work in progress, but it's good to use uh, to learn how to uh, name the data sets, how to structure the folders, uh, how to structure your project. Um, to follow standardized naming conventions uh, and so on. And this is one of the examples of how to create uh, projects that are easy to follow and uh, to have standardized names. And in that way, we can follow which data sets belong to which analyses. And then we can look into where the code should be to reproduce things and why it doesn't work. Uh, another thing is fine naming conventions. This is also not that commonly uh, practiced. It's a big issue uh, when trying to load in data, especially if they're uh, renaming files later on. This is where a lot of the issues occur uh, in, in loading data that is differently named or named not following a convention. So there are maybe a spaces in between words that we cannot see. And then it's very hard to realize that there is an error because of it. And it takes a lot of time to find this error and realize why. So uh, following some of the file naming conventions is the best way to avoid this and also have consistency in naming your files. Um, probably the best way to avoid a lot of the issues with copy pasting errors or in general, anything and making just a really nice, easy to follow workflow is to use Markdown or Quarto or some kind of uh, reporting uh, way of writing code uh, in a way that we can just click and run and then compare that output with the output. And that should be the easiest way to get rid of things. Um, it is still something that is unfail proof. Uh, sadly, it can cause a lot of knitting errors uh, especially if, for instance, uh, a Papaya package, which is used to create uh, reports uh, following APA standards, is a really nice way to uh, avoid copy pasting errors, for instance, uh, because it can create data uh, tables for analyses. However, this might not be the best uh, thing to use if you have uh, more complex analyses. And in that case, you have to go and change things, add things, uh, have different scripts that produce more complex analyses. And then you still have these issues that could lead to not reproducing. Uh, also, VIA requires LATEC uh, or other uh, softwares as well, which can cause troubles depending on different computers that try to reproduce it. So this can also lead again, to uh, not dating properly or causing errors or some of the code not working because it doesn't integrate with your uh, operating system. So all of these practices are something that makes it easy for you to go and see what the error could be uh, and see how you actually got to your results from the analysis. But it's not something that really makes it fail-proof for the analysis to reproduce. And this is where readme files and codebooks come in handy. And these are almost never available. Uh, and I realized these are really take a time. They take a long time to actually write these properly. And it's mostly 
people think they're a waste of time, but it's so useful to have some things in your readme file, like computing environment, saying how long it takes to actually uh, compute things. So we know if we need to run it on a server or on our local computer instead, uh, a project description, um, what, which softwares and which libraries you need to have installed before trying to run it. And also having a code book that tells you which variables uh, do what and um, describe them. So we can try and follow it from the data set through the analysis and we can actually follow what is being done in case you don't use uh, like a markdown to create your results. So instead, if you have scripts, it's so much easier to navigate through these scripts and trying to find which code chunk reproduces uh, which result in the paper. Uh, and another thing that would be very uh, useful in these cases is commenting the code heavily, saying this code chunk will create figure one on page wherever in your manuscript. And in that case, you can go and try to find it more easily, but usually just navigating through the scripts and the data sets is a nightmare sometimes. So this is what also causes issues uh, in reproducing. If you have to go and fetch the results from a list on a different in a different object and then trying to compare it like the confidence intervals are in this object but uh, the beta co coefficient is in another and then you have to try and fetch it on your own this is where you lose a lot of time and it's very hard to follow and this is where mistakes occur if you copy paste them into your manuscript last one is co making containers this would be the best probably practice because this would probably ensure that everything reproduces. It would be really good if people knew how to use Docker. I have issues with Docker. Uh, one other way is to use CodeOcean, which is um, like an online type of Docker where you put in your code um, and it will always reproduce the results as they were. So it saves the environment, it's online, everyone can just come in, log in and click on it and it will always reproduce the same uh, results uh, because it's just a frozen container of your analyses. And this is probably the easiest way to make sure that your code will always reproduce. It does come with some limitations. For instance, I think for researchers, you get like 10 hours a month free to run it. Is that true? Or I think around 10 hours if you're a researcher, it, it comes for free. And then you kind of have to pay for more. Another thing that could be similar to this, but I've had issues with these R, R packages. Uh, R, these are packages that save the version of the package that you used. Um, and I have found that if this package no longer exists, it can really break your whole uh, script. Uh, so it causes sometimes more issues than it helps. Um, so Docker and Code Ocean are a really good option. Our packages that do this, I'm not so sure that they um, actually help over the course of time. And of course, there are point and click alternatives to this. So if you're not comfortable with coding, you can still have your results be easily reproduced uh, with, if you use, for instance, Jasp or Jamovi. Uh, because these files can be saved with the analyses and you can follow which analyses were done and what was used to actually accomplish this. You can also see the data sets and how they were transformed. And you can save all of this in a file and follow it back. And it's a really nice way of having transparent uh, analyses if you're not comfortable with coding. But still, even though you have the data sets in the same file, uh, the actual raw data sets, should be uh, separately provided as a CSV or something else. Okay, so these were the main issues that we come across and we only come across them because we usually have the data and materials and the help of others. So if we had to reproduce things that we saw in different journals, we might have uh, different issues with reproducing. Uh, one thing that is a problem is if the data sets are from uh, some websites that they cannot uh, legally have the data sets for. Uh, 
In that case, sometimes those links break or those data sets update or they change and then we can no longer reproduce the results that they have done. Um, but otherwise, uh, these are the most common issues and most common practices to maybe combat these uh, things. So we would have a task for you. I have put in the chat link. Um, oh, there's a question. Yeah, I believe Docker is more sustainable because it is used in computer science more. I don't know about Code Ocean. That's a really good question is because if it is on a website, it might just shut down at some point. It will be gone along with it. So that's a bit more unsustainable, I would say. I, I, Docker, I think, would be a bit longer here because everything kind of depends on Docker, if I'm um, correct in that. Okay, so in the chat, I have put in the link to the OSA project with three different papers. One uh, had analysis done in Jamovi and two had them done in R. And you can try and reproduce them. So I have put in links in the readme files of each with the preprint or the manuscript uh, and the links to their data and files and materials. And I have also put in the checklist uh, access file so you can try and go through the process and see if you can actually reproduce uh, these results uh, just based on what they offer, uh, which is usually just the materials or if they have readme files uh, or something else. And you can see which problems you, you have witnessed. They could be different problems. You might have troubles reproducing, even the papers that we have published. Uh, and then after an hour, you can come back and we can discuss what you found. <laughs> 